what's the first thing that comes into your head when you hear the term HRT? It might be breast cancer, and here's why. On the morning of July 9th, 2002, the National Institute of Health called a full-blown press conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. to make an announcement about the WHI study. Good morning. First, women should not start or continue this therapy to prevent heart disease. The findings show it doesn't work. In fact, the therapy increases the risk for a heart attack or stroke. Additionally, it increases the risk for uh, breast cancer and for blood clots. And then, to make sure the word got out, sent experts and officials to hit the morning and evening news circuit. Their message was completely unexpected and was shocking. The WHI, which stands for the Women's Health Initiative, is a large American study that first started in the early 90s and is still going on today. It has looked at various different women's health issues and different treatments, and part of the WHI was a trial looking specifically at the health risks and the health benefits of HRT, hormone replacement therapy. And in 2002, five years after that trial started, they held that press conference to announce some of their findings. That announcement had a huge impact on HRT. Women stopped using it and doctors stopped prescribing it. HRT was mud. Although most people followed the WHI advice and steered clear of HRT, there were some who didn't. One of those people was Professor John Studd, who you might remember was the gynecologist we mentioned back in part two, who coined the term reproductive depression. Here's what he said about the WHI. This study is the wrong population, the wrong drug, and the wrong conclusions. So let's take a look at each of these three things to see what he was talking about. We mentioned earlier how we've long known that oestrogen is protective for women's hearts. And this is the main reason that heart disease and other cardiovascular problems go up after menopause. So people wondered if giving women oestrogen again after menopause might reduce their heart disease risk. This was the main research question that the WHI set out to answer. Most of the women enrolled for the trial were many years past their menopause and no longer having any menopause symptoms at all. They'd either all settled or they were amongst those lucky women who never got any. The average age of the women was 63 with nearly half of them being aged between 60 and 69, and nearly one quarter being aged between 70 and 79. There were no women under 50 included. When we prescribe HRT, we prescribe it to women who are having symptoms. We also normally tend to give it to women who are in perimenopause, or within around 10 years of their last period. So this is what Professor Studd meant by the wrong population, because the women in the WHI trial did not well represent the kind of women we normally give HRT to, both because of their older age and their lack of symptoms. There are different types of hormone products out there. We can either mimic the natural hormone perfectly, so-called body identical hormones, or we can use what's referred to as synthetic hormones, which are very similar to our natural ones, but not exactly the same molecular structure. We can also give hormones via different routes. As we talked about earlier, we can apply oestrogen just to the vagina with a vesting cream or pessaries. So it just acts within that vicinity to help symptoms affecting our vagina and our vulva, bladder and pelvic floor too. We also talked about how we can use a progesterone just inside the womb through the Mirena coil to help with heavy or erratic periods. But to treat symptoms beyond our vagina and womb, we need hormones to go everywhere. This is what systemic hormone therapy means. We're treating the whole system of the woman's body and brain by getting the hormones into the bloodstream. We have different options for systemic hormone therapy. We can either take the hormones orally and go through the gut to get into the bloodstream, or we can go through the skin, 
which is called the transdermal route. This is a way to absorb into the bloodstream without getting the gut involved. And the way you give a woman oestrogen in particular really makes a difference. All oral types of oestrogen, including the combined contraceptive pill and the oral oestrogen we can use in HRT, carry a small increased risk of blood clots. Most women don't get clots from oral oestrogen, but some women do. The risk is small enough that we still prescribe it, but we don't prescribe it to women who are already at higher risk of blood clots. But when you give systemic oestrogen through the skin, either as a patch or a gel, you do not have the small increased risk of blood clots. We think this is because you cut out the gut and therefore also the liver. This is where clotting factors are produced. And we think that in some women, oral oestrogen can stimulate the liver to produce more clotting factors, although the precise mechanism is actually not fully certain. In the WHI, they didn't use transdermal oestrogen. They chose to use oral oestrogen in the form of a medication called Premarin. So a small increased clotting risk would be expected, especially in the older women they were giving it to, because our clot risk goes up anyway as we age. Premarin is also not body identical. It's actually a mixture of several different types of oestrogens, including some that are made using the hormones from pregnant horses' urine. For the progesterone, the WHI chose a medication called Provera, which is also not body identical. When it comes to different progesterones, the risks overall are slightly higher with synthetic ones when compared to body identical forms from both a cardiovascular and breast cancer point of view. So this is what Professor Studd meant by the wrong drug. The WHI were using non-body identical hormones and an oral form of oestrogen. So this was not the type of HRT with the best safety profile, especially for older women. The last part of Professor Studd's criticism is probably the most important one. This one's all about how the WHI reported their findings. The trial included three main groups of women, a combined HRT group, an estrogen only HRT group, and a no HRT group. The women in the first group were given combined HRT. This means they took both hormones. So they took one estrogen tablet, Premarin, and one progesterone one, Provera. In the estrogen only group, the women were given estrogen alone. This means they were only given the Premarin and no Provera, so no progesterone. These were women who'd had a hysterectomy. And the third group of women were given placebo or inactive medications, so no HRT. They were either given two placebo tablets to mimic what the combined group got, or just one tablet to mimic the estrogen only group. So they had these different groups of women and they followed them over time for a period of at least five years to see what good or bad things happened for them. The big question is, did they find any differences between the groups? And the even bigger question is, were those differences big enough to tell the whole world about? Let's start with what they found for the combined HRT group, because these were the results they announced first during that press conference in 2002. They didn't tell us about the estrogen only group results until 2004. So here are the findings from the WHI trial looking at combined HRT versus no HRT. Red is bad news, blue is good news. The numbers on each column are the numbers of women out of 10,000 women who had that particular outcome, good or bad. So on the negative side, they found that out of 10,000 women taking combined HRT, there'd be six extra cases of heart disease, eight extra cases of breast cancer, seven extra strokes, and 18 extra clots. On the positive side, they found seven less cases of bowel cancer, along with five less hip fractures, 47 less all types of fracture, and 15 less cases of diabetes. So what do all these numbers actually mean? Every clinical trial has to do what's called a significance test on the data. 
This means working out if the difference between two groups is big enough to be significant, which means it's likely that the medication is causing the difference. When this calculation was done on the data, only one negative finding was significant, and it was the one we already knew about, the clot-related risks from oral estrogen. And if they'd used transdermal estrogen instead, then this clot risk likely would not have been there. There was also some significant positive findings too for bone health and diabetes risk, but these significant positive findings did not make the headlines. There were also other findings within the data that were not specifically looked for in the original analysis. These relate to the age when HRT is started, because it turns out this makes a difference. That graph we just looked at were the results for all the women aged from 50 to 79. Following the 2002 announcement, other research decided to look at the data in terms of different age groups. And here is what they found when they just looked at the results for women under 60. There is still some red, but the numbers are even smaller. And that includes the breast cancer risk, which dropped from eight cases out of 10,000 women to six cases. And there's also an extra blue one too, quite an important one, because the data on women under 60 show that the women on combined HRT lived longer than the women on no HRT. And what about the estrogen only group, the women who'd had a hysterectomy, so didn't take any progesterone? These findings didn't come out till 2004, but they didn't get quite the same attention as the 2002 results did. So here are all the findings for the women who took estrogen only HRT compared to the women who didn't take any. This time there were less red findings and more blue ones. And again, the only significant negative findings were the ones we already knew, the ones that involve clot-related risks from oral estrogen. Using transdermal estrogen instead would likely have removed these risks. And when you look at the breast cancer finding, it's in blue. Women on estrogen-only HRT in the WHI trial had slightly lower rates of breast cancer than women on no HRT. The difference was not statistically significant, but then neither was the small increased breast cancer risk they'd found for the combined HRT group, yet that finding had a huge impact on the prescribing of HRT. Just like what was done with the 2002 results, other researchers decided to look at these estrogen-only results, but just focus on the women under 60. Here's what those findings looked like. This time, there was only one red finding, and it was that clot risk from oral estrogen again. All the other outcomes were positive, including the breast cancer one. And just like with the women on combined HRT, there was a reduction in all-cause mortality too, which means the women on estrogen-only HRT lived longer than the women not on any HRT. So this is what Professor Studd meant by the wrong conclusions, because the WHI results did not show a big enough difference between the groups when it came to breast cancer risk. So they couldn't actually conclude that HRT increased the risk of breast cancer. But this is what they told the world. And then four years after that 2002 announcement, something else emerged from the WHI data to cast even more doubt on the link between HRT and breast cancer. So let's take a look at what that was. Some of the women in the WHI trial had taken HRT before, back when they were having some menopausal symptoms. When they joined the trial, they were then either given HRT again, or they were given the placebo. In 2006, some of the original WHI researchers decided to look at the data for the combined HRT group again, and this time separate women into those who'd taken HRT in the past, and those who'd never taken it. And when they did that, and looked at how much breast cancer happened, they found something important. This is what they found when they looked at the breast cancer rates for all the women in the trial who'd never taken any HRT before. The grey line is the women who got given combined HRT in the trial for the first time ever, and the orange line is the women who got given the placebo medication. 
And the two lines were equivalent to each other. There was no difference in the rates of breast cancer between the women on HRT and the women not on HRT among those who'd never used HRT before in the past. And this is the graph for women who had taken HRT before at some point in their life. The gray line is those women who were given HRT in the WHI trial, so they were taking it for the second time in their life. And the orange line is the women who got the placebo medication in the trial, but had taken HRT before. And there is a difference between these two groups. The placebo group had a lower risk than the group who were given combined HRT. But the question is this, were they different because the risk for the HRT group was big, or was it because the risk for the placebo group was small? Well, it turns out it was the second answer. The rate in the HRT group was not big. It was actually the same as the breast cancer rate for the general population at that time. And it was also the same as the two groups in the first graph I showed you. It was the rate in the placebo group that was the odd one out because they had a strangely low risk of breast cancer, lower than the general population at that time. So what does this mean? It means that the slightly higher, but not statistically significant, risk of breast cancer found in the combined HRT group may not have been because they actually had a higher risk, but it may have been because they were being compared to women who had an unusually lower risk. And some people have suggested that this lower risk may have come from the fact that those women had previously taken HRT. But what about heart disease and HRT? Because that, after all, was the thing the WHI was primarily looking at. And they concluded that HRT increased the risk of heart disease. So let's take a look at whether they were right. Prior to the WHI, there was a body of research suggesting that HRT lowered the risk of heart disease in women. And this fitted with what we already knew about the protective role of natural estrogen on women's cardiovascular system. But then the WHI reported their increased risk in their large clinical trial. This led to years of debate in the research as well as more studies until eventually everyone finally agreed on something. And it's called the timing hypothesis. The risks and benefits from HRT differ depending on the age the woman is when she first starts taking it. We think women get the most benefits and the least risks from HRT if it started within around 10 years of the last period or before the age of around 60. Within this time window, research shows that HRT leads to statistically significant lower rates of heart disease and a significant reduction in deaths from all causes. Outside of this time window, so for women older than 60 or more than 10 years since menopause, there is no effect at all, good or bad, on risk of heart disease and overall mortality. So starting HRT in later life is not more risky from a heart disease and longevity point of view, but it's not as beneficial. So Professor Studd was right about the WHI on all three counts, but mud sticks. And the WHI report and all the attention it got has plagued menopause care for two decades. It made many women and doctors understandably nervous about using hormones. But in reality, for the vast majority of women, the risks are low and the benefits are high. So HRT should definitely be on the table of options for women who are suffering with symptoms. So let's now take a closer look at HRT and see what it actually involves.